Hey, what's up everyone? Welcome to the 100th episode of Spitting Venom, aka the Venom Vlog. Thank you all for getting us to this point and for keeping me going all these uh, all these four months now. Uh, to, I was like thinking about it. Someone was like, how did you make 100 episodes of this show in just four months? And I said, well, pretty much I do an episode almost every day. Uh, but when we started this, it wasn't the case. I think the first episode came out November 5th, and then we didn't do another episode until Thanksgiving. So it was like three week jump. Uh, but then when I saw the reaction to it and then the way people connected with it and the way people seemed interested in it and that some of the even people were like, hey, I'm learning stuff about Venom, um, that was really cool. And to see it grow in this way has just been amazing. So I just want to take a minute here to say thanks, everyone, for getting us to 100 episodes. Uh, we're just past four months exactly. We're like five days or six days past. Um, and uh, I just got finished watching uh, Spider-Man 3. And so some of you have requested me uh, to do a discussion or breakdown of this movie. So this isn't going to be essentially a review. This is just going to be me talking about the movie and specifically the editor's cut because I actually didn't know this existed until about a week ago. And someone told me, I think at work, like, oh, have you watched the editor's cut yet? And I said, what are you talking about? What do you mean editor's cut? Why would the editor get uh, to make a cut of the movie for a DVD release? And they're like, oh, I think it's just like a special edition version for like a recent release, recently released box set or something. I don't know all the details. So if you guys do, let me know down below. Uh, but it was on Amazon Video. So I was able to rent it for like $2.99. And I was like, yeah, it's worth $3 to, to watch this cut. And I haven't seen the original uh, Spider-Man 3 in a while. I mean, it's been a while since I've seen it. So I can't compare and contrast. I'm sure there are other, you know, videos out there that have done that and showed the differences between the two. We're not going to talk about that here today. And we're also not going to talk about what could have been because obviously I worked at Sony for a short time after uh, this movie came out. Uh, and uh, and I know other things that could have happened and should have happened and the fourth movie that could have been made. And we're not going to talk about any of that stuff today. Today is just for Spider-Man 3 because it is the first time we got Venom in a live action format. And so that's why I wanted to talk about it because, uh, you know, with the new movie coming up, it just makes sense to eventually, at some point, we were going to have to talk about this movie. So I figured with a 300 or 100th episode, we can just kind of go crazy and talk for a while. So this might be a little uh, video longer than usual. Uh, my my first uh, time seeing this movie came out, you know, it was like 11 years ago in 2007. I was just about to leave Florida. I was just about to move away. I had, I think like a month earlier, uh, broken up with someone that I was seeing for a while um, named Nikki. I think we had like, you know, I knew, she knew I was moving and she was staying in Florida and she was in the Air Force and, and uh, or in the military. And we were like, oh, let's, you know, I I'm going to be leaving. It just made sense, I guess, at the time to uh, to break up, and uh, and there, but there was this uh, girl that I was a friend with for a while, and I actually had a crush on, and uh, she and I had, um, uh, I think that after this movie, after we saw it, I think like we had our first kiss, uh, but it was like literally days before I started to drive out here to L.A. Um, so I, I, and again, my memories are kind of for crap. So, but I do remember. I remember just that kind of time a little bit, uh, and it was uh, how much it meant to me. Uh, and I was like, all right, let's, you know, this is a sad note to drive away from Florida on. I mean, it was almost to the point where I almost stayed in Florida, uh, but I was like, no, you know, I already made this plan. I don't have a place to live here in Florida. I should just, you know, I had a place starting to line up in California. I should just come out here, take this job, you know, that I had when I got out here and just, just keep driving, you know, and, and as hard as it was. And, uh, and coming out here, you know, was awesome because I met Ben and James and we wrote a Spider-Man 4 screenplay together. I ended up working at Sony for a while. And so Spider-Man, like I said, at pretty much every pivotal point in my life, I can tie back to a Spider-Man or a Venom comic or X-Men comic. I can always tie it back to a comic book because comic books have been in my life ever since I first read them when I was six years old. Uh, so every major moment in my life, you know, can be tethered to some comic book in some way or shape or form. Uh, with Venom, though, uh, this is, I remember being, you know, at Comic-Con and them showing the footage of uh, Topher Grace playing Venom. They showed the scene where, you know, right out of the comic book, there was, uh, Spider-Man was up in the church bells. The bells were going off. He's ripping the suit off. It looks so insane. The suit drips down, latches onto Eddie Brock, and then he falls to the ground, coughs up all this ink. The it suit's wrapping around him, and then he looks up at the camera, smiles, and the symbiote wraps around him, forms the teeth, and he jumps right at the camera. And I remember that moment and just being like, holy crap, we are getting Venom. They are bringing Venom to life in this movie. And at first, I actually didn't care that Topher Grace was playing the character. Um, I, I didn't have a, a big opinion on that. I just, you know, from that sequence, I was like, well, this looks awesome, so let, let's hope the movie is awesome. 
And, uh, and you know, re-watching it now, I gotta say, there is a lot of good in this movie, but uh, I can see there's a ton of bad in this movie. Um, and I and like I said, I'm judging the editor's cut, so I don't know what the major differences are. So if I'm, you know, talking about something that you're like, huh, what's going on? It's probably because it's from this cut uh, that is the most recent cut of the film that was released. And like I said, you could, you know, rent it on Amazon if you want. Uh, but uh, in this cut, they, you know, it seemed like pretty much the same movie, maybe with a couple additional scenes. It is a little bit longer, and then some scenes seem rearranged. But again, I can't, I'm not an expert in, uh, you know, comparing the two. I don't remember the original one that well. Uh, so movie starts off, you get your credit sequences. In the credit, you know, it's showing you basically the story so far. It's showing you, you know, Peter Parker's life, how he got bit by the spider. Um, the Green Goblin, Harry Osborn, it's showing you all that stuff, Mary Jane, you know, everything, uh, Dr. Octopus, and it's kind of catching you up. Um, in a way, it's kind of effective, but at the same time, it's long and, and kind of boring in a way, because uh, if you have seen the other movies, you're not getting new information. If you haven't seen the movies, why are you jumping into part three? Uh, but just in case you are, you know, every comic someone's first comic, so they treated this like every movie someone's first movie, so they wanted to catch you up a little bit. Uh, but I feel like that could have been time used. That's, that was like three minutes long, that, that intro. Uh, they could have used that time to develop more story uh, for the symbiote. Uh, you know, right when the movie opens up, you're thrown right into Peter Parker's life, which I like. It's like, all right, Mary Jane's on stage. She's singing. He's, you know, uh, you know, in heaven. He's watching her. He actually shows up to her performance, which, you know, that was a, a thing in the second movie. So you see that they might be starting to... Um, you know get along and they're they're really in love with each other and afterwards their banter between the two of them is really good but then you also see you know harry osborne looming in the in the shadows and he's kind of keeping an eye on this and he's trying to figure out a way to use this you know to his advantage to hurt peter parker uh, and unfortunately he doesn't really get the chance because peter parker you know knocks him on the head and he gets amnesia which is the dumbest written thing uh, in this movie one of the two dumbest things in this movie and uh, and it's frustrating too because there was great scenes later where Harry is like using Mary Jane to to blackmail her to you know to break it off with Peter and I felt like man if you just cut out the amnesia thing and you just had him do that in the movie it would have made him a really sinister bad guy it would have really you know twisted him and you would have really sold him as a bad guy and then that way when he turns at the end it would have been a much more effective turn uh, because you would have been like all right the theme of the movie is forgiveness. And now, in order to forgive himself, he is going to go into the battle and save Peter Parker and Mary Jane from certain death. And to me, I think that would have just been a much stronger turn if they would have just committed to that and not take away the amnesia thing. I think what they wanted was they wanted scenes where you saw that, you know, Harry wasn't such a bad guy. Because in the second movie, he kind of was like, you know, going over the edge. And I think they wanted to remind you that uh, he was a good guy and best friends with him at one point. In which case, my argument to that is, well, I would have done a flashback sequence or I would have, you know, done scenes where I would have cast a younger Mary Jane and Harry and showed them like in middle school and just shown new scenes uh, where Harry was a good kid. Uh, but again, you know, uh, they didn't go that route. Uh, the Sandman intro was kind of neat. Uh, at first, I didn't like it. I mean, oh, at the first, I'm sorry, at first, I really liked it. Uh, at first, it's like him, you know, um, uh, going into his apartment and he sees his daughter and he's like, you know, he has like an emotional reaction to her and you're like, okay, this is great. It's setting up, um, you know, heart. For this villain, uh, you, you're just seeing that there's a human side to him, and uh, and and I thought Thomas Hayden Church pulled that off really well. Uh, but then soon after that, you get like a, you actually you get another great scene. Uh, and sorry, I have a couple notes here because I wanted to remember some of the order. Uh, Peter and Aunt May talking, and I actually really like that scene uh, because I like their relationship in these three movies. And Peter, uh, you know, he's talking to her, and he's, you know, the wisdom of Aunt May. She's like, you know, a husband has to put his wife first. Uh, before all else and obviously she's referring to him being spider-man because i think there's this unspoken thing where she knows he's spider-man and uh and he's you know kind of like all right i think i can do that i think i can do that and then pretty much he struggles with that through the rest of the movie but she does give him her ring that uncle ben gave her and i just thought that scene was really great because it set up the next scene where harry shows up and just starts beating the crap out of spider-man and the you know throughout the whole battle he's trying to you know, keep the ring. The ring, you know, gets knocked out of his pocket and he grabs it and it falls out of his hand. He, re you know, swings to get it and it adds something to that battle. And to me, that's really great when action movies can do that, where they can add something emotional into the scene. And it, it was already emotional because Peter had to fight his best friend. But at the same time, when you throw that ring in there, 
it added another level to that sequence. And re-watching it, I was like, wow, that was really, really well done in my opinion. I thought that was amazing. And it was a great setup. And then you have him fighting so hard to, you know, hold on to the thing that he believes in most, which is being in love with Mary Jane. Um, and so I liked that sequence a lot. I thought that was really well done. Um, the, the CGI is not great, obviously, in a lot of these scenes, but that's probably because they just don't hold up. These are from like 11 years ago, so I'm not going to hold the movie too much to that uh, when talking about it. Um, but I hated the amnesia thing I thought that was so stupid and just a waste of time and it was pretty much just a way so they can move Harry off the board so they could bring in Sandman and set up Eddie Brock which is what they do next and uh, and I think there's a better way to juggle that uh, the easiest way is to take one of those characters away uh, but since they didn't have that option uh, I think they could have cleaned that up a little bit more maybe in editing or even in this in the script writing uh, phase but again I think they filmed some of this movie and then they in they originally were gonna do two movies and I think they had to cut stuff and fit it all in this movie. So maybe it wasn't, you know, maybe they didn't have the opportunity to write one coherent script. Uh, but I don't know the full story about that, around that, actually. Uh, so, but the sequence where he's, you know, Sandman's running by the police and he's getting chased and he hits the dog or whatever. Uh, that whole sequence was stupid. It's just like an arbitrary random test being done out in the middle of nowhere. They don't explain anything. They don't set that up. They don't explain what's going on. He goes into the thing and then gets vaporized. That part I didn't like because it you know just was so arbitrary but the part where he actually forms and becomes sandman and he's like the music's playing it's the score is so beautiful and he like lifts his hand and he reaches for his daughter's pendant and you're like wow okay that was really well shot really well done very emotional for me i really like that and it made me really pull in and care about this character and also care about him on a visual level because i was like wow they're actually adding like something really elegant to this uh, Sandman character and they're actually doing something unique with them uh, and, and filming him a different way than they filmed, you know, uh, Green Goblin and, uh, and Doc Ock. Like, there's a little bit more elegance to him. And I thought I actually really appreciated that as someone who'd never really cared too much about the character in the comics. I thought it sold me in the movie uh, very well. Uh, then after that, and what I mean by like when, you know, when he's running and he just comes across this random test, even though the theme in this movie is supposed to be forgiveness, there's a lot of other themes, which that's okay. You can have multiple themes in a movie, but a lot of them collide in some, like not in the most organic ways. So you have like ego is a big theme in this movie because Peter and Mary Jane just act like selfish idiots through most of the movie. And that's why they, you know, pull apart when I felt like what you could have done is had Harry manipulate Mary Jane earlier in the movie and have her break it off with Peter on the night he's about to marry her and have all that set up by uh, Harry and then have Peter's reactions to it be because of the black suit, which, you know, they set up in the beginning when it just arbitrarily crashes near Peter Parker on a meteor and latches onto his bike. And then it doesn't attach to him until an hour later. And that is such a waste of time and a lot of character uh, moments that Peter could have had where he's not acting like Peter Parker. Uh, so, again, pacing, you know, juggling this movie has a huge problem with doing that and, and pulling it off. It just can't do it. Um, so you have you know, that beautiful scene with Sandman. The arbitrary stuff, like I said, it's one thing to have a one or two movie coincidences where it's like, oh, I'm walking down the street and oh, look, I run into Harry Osborn. Like you can have a couple of those in a movie, like two, maybe two, maybe three at the most, uh, but you gotta make them you know, work and effective. And it's like, all right, they're in New York, they're walking around, they probably live near each other in the same neighborhoods. So it makes sense. Maybe they'd run into each other from time to time, but you gotta do it like that. This movie just, Everything is a movie coincidence. The the reason most people come together in this movie is purely out of coincidence. Um, or, you know, in the few times where it's like, oh, I know Harry's at home. I'm going to go attack Harry at home. It's literally like that obvious a lot of times. And it's it's bad. Like when you're watching this movie, I'm like, wow. So we just they're just there now. And oh, OK. Oh, they're just there now. And oh, you know, uh, Sandman, you know, he's in the right alley at the right time when Venom swings by and he hits him and they, you know, they decide to team up. It's like everything is so movie convenient uh that it's just bad it's just really bad writing and bad story structure uh, on every level uh, i did like that eddie brock speaking of venom uh they do set up eddie brock he's a very sleazy dude he uh you know is all into manipulating the truth i think this is where maybe uh you know zeb wells kind of pulled from or i can't remember which came out first if it was dark origin or this i think dark origin might have come out first uh, but i know in this movie they call him eddie brock jr which is from the ultimate comic books and we will definitely get into those at some point we're going to do ultimate week 
and we're going to talk about all the Ultimate Universe versions of the symbiotes, uh, you know, both Venom and Carnage. So we'll get into all of what that means. Uh, but there is an Eddie Brock Jr. in the Ultimate Universe. Uh, so they set him up in this. He's Eddie Brock Jr. He's kind of a sleazy dude. He uh, He's willing to manipulate things and Photoshop things in order to get what he wants. He's willing to lie. He's willing to flirt. And then he also gets attached too easily. Like he, he feels a connection to Gwen. And then when she's like, uh, yeah, we just had coffee. He like, you see in his face, he gets a little angry. So they definitely portray that side of Eddie. And they totally have Eddie embrace the earlier comics where he's just a bad guy before they brought Ann Weying in and Carnage in before they brought in something to, you know, make him look less of a bad guy like Carnage. He's just the full on villain in this movie. Even at the end, when he has a chance to kill Peter, he says, look, dude, I like being a bad guy. It makes me happy. Uh, and so, yeah, his, his life was ruined by Peter Parker. He was, you know, again, he did it to himself, but then Peter threw it in his face and exposed him. So, uh, he has a, a hatred for Peter Parker, which is, you know, very similar to the comics. Not exactly. There's no Sin Eater or anything like that, but it's, they did it. I thought they did it pretty well considering the amount of scenes they had with Eddie. So I actually didn't have a problem with some of this stuff, uh, with the Eddie Brock stuff. I thought he kind of was set up pretty well, uh, but then he just all of a sudden becomes the bad guy at the end, and I thought that was way too quick. I would have rather had Eddie get the suit like maybe an hour or an hour and a half or an hour and 15 minutes into the movie and then see a couple scenes with him adjusting to it, you know, maybe uh, terrorizing Gwen, terrorizing Mary Jane. You know, I would have liked to see more of that uh, personally. Uh, then you see, you know, Mary Jane, like I said, she has a big ego in this movie. When she goes out, you know, she's like, you know, I, I think people are going to applaud me. Then she gets the bad review that brings her down, that every review about her is bad. And then she gets fired from her job. When she comes outside, people are clapping, and she immediately thinks it's for her. Like, oh, people like me. And she sees it's for Spider-Man, so there's like a jealousy thing going on there. Uh, and then meanwhile, Peter is so caught up in the headlights of, uh, you know, within the spotlight, I guess, of being Spider-Man, that he decides to, you know, uh, get an ego himself. He kisses Gwen Stacy on the stage, upside down, not thinking for one second about Mary Jane's feelings, which, like I said, would make a little bit more sense if he had the black suit on at this time, but he doesn't. So, uh, so it just makes him a real jerk, and it makes him and Mary Jane both look like real selfish pricks in this movie, uh, to be honest with you. And uh, almost at a point where you just don't want them to be get together anymore because they're so destructive in this movie towards each other's feelings, and so uh, you know, um, absent when it comes to each other's feelings. And even though Mary Jane does try to put in a good effort to be there for Peter when he needs it, when he finds out that Sandman is actually the one who killed his uncle. You know, she, you know, he, he pushes her away and he, you know, he does the thing where he doesn't turn off the radio, but he turns it down a little bit. And he's like, yeah, F you. I'm going to listen for Flint Marco and get my revenge. And, uh, and she's trying to save him from going down that path and he doesn't allow it, you know, because of uh, revenge has taken over. So it's another theme in this movie. So it's like revenge and ego and friendship and forgiveness are all these themes. And like I said, at some times they just collide with each other and they don't mesh well organically. Uh, but, uh, you know, and then Peter takes the suit, you know, it, it's taken over him. In this new editor cut, he struggles with it a little bit more. He takes it off, puts it back on. I don't know why. Uh, I thought once the suit would bond to him, he wouldn't take it off, but it's bonded to his costume, I guess. So he takes off his costume. And that really doesn't work for me too much in this movie because if the, if the symbiote is bonded to his costume, uh, then when he rips it off later, it technically he's ripping off his costume, uh, his original costume, but yet it's he sees it under the bed, he pulls out his original costume, so I'm like, okay, so I guess that means the suit replicated his costume, so if that's the version that they're going with, is that it can shapeshift like it does in the comics, then why does he need to go buy a, a suit and do the goofy dancing scene to buy a suit, you know, like why doesn't this, the symbiote just become a tuxedo or a suit for him? And I think they should have played up more with that. I mean, because really it would have only taken one extra sequence with, um, you know, with special effects to show the suit change into that. Uh, but then after the, the next sequence where he's wearing it, it could have just been like, all right, same thing. You know, they just put on the regular suit that he was wearing. So to me, they, they didn't really establish really what the suit was, and they try to do it in one scene with Dr. Kirk Connors explaining that it's like a, a, what did he say? I think it's like a Kendretic meteorite from the 60s, and it's just such a throwaway line explanation where he tries to give you a little backstory, and he says, oh, it's it's adding to your, you know, aggression. It can amplify aggression, and it's like, yeah, it's all these things were like so oversimplified or under, you know, uh, fleshed out that it, and underdeveloped that it just really gave the suit no purpose uh, a lot of times in the movie and especially when it didn't really influence 
uh, all the early stuff with Peter Parker, only like two or three scenes that it show him where he like accidentally hit Mary Jane and when he threw a pumpkin bomb in, in Harry's face. Uh, but uh, other than that, the, those are only things that the suit made him do that made him regret what he did. Other than, I mean, he also used it to kill Sandman by dousing him with water. But later on, we found out Sandman didn't die anyway. Uh, but still, that anger in Peter's heart made him was what made him take off the suit the first time and uh, i think he should have uh, you know maybe kept the suit off at that point and that's maybe where he should have separated from it is after you know possibly killing flint marco that's i think the scene uh that should have made him realize like okay i, I the first guy in the first movie the burglar he accidentally died and then norman osborne accidentally died and then doc ock you know sacrificed himself to save the city at the end so now I'm responsible possibly for actually killing someone on purpose. And that should have been the breaking point for for him to rip off the suit. Uh, but I think also a good breaking point was him accidentally hitting Mary Jane. But at the same time, like, that happened so late in the movie. It's like, all right, either move that up or, you know, or whatever. Uh, so, again, pacing is kind of the thing with this movie and trying to do too much in such a short amount of time, really. Because two hours and 20 minutes or whatever is not enough time to tell this story with this many villains. Um, it could have maybe been if they balanced it a little bit better, but that means every scene would have just been like, go, go, go. And that's a little hard to do in these movies, uh, you know, to have it like that and then care about these characters. So in the end, you know, Peter and Harry, you know, he goes to Harry after blowing up half his face and he's like, look, I know you hate me, but Mary Jane needs us. And he's like, yeah, well, I'm not going to help you. And he's like, it's not about me. It's about her. You know, we were all friends, like, you know, please. And Harry's like, no. So, you know, Spider-Man goes and Venom has, because there's only a short amount of time left in this movie, Venom is just like, all right, I got Sandman. I got Mary Jane. We're on the news. And then the rest of the movie starts being, you know, with all this exposition from the news. And there's like these news reporters going, can Spider-Man stop the bad guy? What's going to happen to Spider-Man? What's going to happen to Mary Jane? An actress was captured. Oh, my goodness. And they're like doing all this like bad exposition that the audience just doesn't need at all. Uh, and so it's just so poorly done. And the last act this movie is like it could have been good because the fight is actually decent and the scenes with Venom and Spider-Man are really good. I love when Spider-Man puts the pipes down and uses that the sound to to hurt Venom and separate him from Eddie Brock. I liked that. I liked all the moments with Sandman fighting uh, you know, uh, Green Goblin or New Goblin um, but I didn't like some of the quips back and forth. I thought Harry would have been a little bit more intense in that final battle. He's still an intense dude uh, so I thought he should have been a little less jokey and Peter should have tried to do the jokes and maybe Harry been like dude now's not the time. He's like our lives are at stake mary jane's life is at stake and he's like yeah okay you're right you know there should have been more of that um uh, between the two of them not just goofy banter uh back and forth and uh you know but at the same time it was partly good seeing them be friends again at the very end and when harry makes that big sacrifice at the end I actually really like that moment, and I like the destruction of Venom. He is he super dies in this movie, uh, so like he, he the bomb goes off and you actually see a skeleton for a quick second, and then he vaporizes. So uh, I don't know if they still had plans for Venom after this. I don't know what they were gonna do unless they were gonna make it Eddie Brock Senior, and you know he's out for revenge against Spider Man. Uh, and he and then Eddie Brock Sr. maybe looks like Eddie Brock from the comics, and maybe that was the route they were gonna go. I don't know. Uh, but uh, and then you know. Again, Venom or Venom's gone. Sandman asks for forgiveness, or he says, "I don't need your forgiveness, but I just want you to understand what I did. I didn't mean to kill your uncle; it was an accident." And Peter says, "No, I forgive you." And then at the end, he goes and confesses to Harry, "I'm sorry, I did all these bad things to both of you." And Harry's like, "It doesn't matter, Peter. Like you're my friend, and in these last moments." It doesn't matter. Like, you know, obvious, without saying it, he's like, you're forgiven. So forgiveness is a big theme in this movie. That's why even Peter says, oh, you want forgiveness, Eddie Brock? Go to church. Like, go find religion. So uh, even though Eddie goes in there and he doesn't ask for forgiveness, he asks God to kill Spider-Man, uh, Peter Parker, for some reason. Um, but yeah, uh, anyway, the movie overall, it's okay. I mean, it's it, rewatching it now. I was like, all right, it, it's, it was fun to revisit this, especially seeing a slightly different cut of the movie. There was a great scene where they, I'm pretty sure this is new, where they added where Sandman, after he comes out of the sewer, when he when Spider-Man thought he killed him, where he uh, makes a sand castle for his daughter in the park, and his daughter sees it. And I was like, oh, that's a nice touching moment. And then he says, you know, I'll, I won't let Spider-Man get in my way of helping you again. And that's why he teams up with Venom. So it adds a little bit more to that sequence later when he teams up with Venom, but still when he teams up with Venom, it's an arbitrary scene that comes out of left field where they just randomly run into each other in New York. Uh, but uh, overall, you know, it was fun watching it. I would love to know what you guys think. Have you seen the editor's cut? Or if you haven't, what do you think of the original movie? Uh, let me know down in the comments below. And thank you so much for watching this video, for you know being subscribed to this channel, for supporting us for 100 episodes. We're definitely going to probably hit 100 more before the movie comes out, I hope anyway. That 
that would be really awesome. And we have other stuff coming up. The Spawn Show uh, we're going to do called Afterlife. And then also be sure, I'll put a link down below. I was on a podcast for Fanbase Press. I was on a podcast la- uh, this uh, earlier tonight with them. And I will put a link down below because we talk about some Venom stuff on there. And we talk about other things happening in the world of comics and movies and geek culture. And I think you guys would like it. So definitely check that out down below and subscribe to them as well. They're super awesome people. So as always, guys, thank you so much. we got a lot more coming up on this channel, so stay tuned. I'll see you in the future. Peace.